Good morning, and um, let me add my words of welcome and thanks to everyone for coming. And I'd like to start by um, thanking PEPFAR and USAID for, and everybody else involved for believing in this project and working with us along 18 months. It's been intense and exciting. And I'm sure I say on behalf of the many scholars and researchers who were involved in this project that um, it's enriched our lives as much as we hope that what we are bringing to you will enrich the work. I'd also like to acknowledge the, the many scholars and researchers who were involved with this project along the way, some of whom we're very lucky to have with us today to speak on their own subject, and that's much appreciated. And to start with, I really would like to acknowledge the important role the children have played in this epidemic. And just to remind you of two children in particular, the one is Ryan White, um, who through his life gave rise to one of the most powerful pieces of legislation in the United States um, to provide funds for, for people um, living with HIV. And the other is somebody from my own um, country, Corsi Johnson, who spoke at the age of 11 at the 13th International AIDS Conference in Durban. And I think the pathos um, that surrounded Corsi's talk really brought home the importance of expanding treatment. And I see it as one of the steps on the way to the 3 by 5 initiative, which was introduced in 2003, um, which massively expanded treatment and brought us to the point where we are now. I also want to acknowledge the incredible progress that we, has been made in the HIV and AIDS field over the last few, few years, five years. Um, and this progress has really inspired for me hope that we can catch up needed services and support for children as part of this broader epidemic response. So the progress we've made is, is evident in the prevention of infections amongst children, the declining new adult infections, and treatment for adults who survive and can can continue to look after and care for their own children. The areas where we desperately need to catch up for children are in early HIV diagnosis, treatment access, care and support, and prevention of HIV infection in adolescence and young adulthood. Now, we talk about affected children, and in preparing, in working on this project, I came to think about this affected children in a different way. We think about it in the past tense, almost. But if you look at the UNAIDS 2013 data, 155,000 new adult HIV infections occur every day. If we take dependency ratios that vary between 41 to 100 for young people, that's under the age of 15, um, globally it's 41 to 100, um, and in Africa 80 to 100, this means that between half a million and probably closer to one million children are newly affected by HIV every single week. So there isn't, there isn't a population of affected children. Present and future children are affected in an ongoing and cumulative way as we speak. And these effects have occurred over three generations and will persist in occurring probably for the next three. And it's something you'll hear from Chris as well. Just the size, the sheer size of this problem and the nature of its moving target. It is not a sense that there is a group of children that today we need to go out and reach. That group is growing all the time. So what do we know about long-term effects? Well, cohorts which enrolled HIV-positive mothers and their exposed children began in the US, the UK, Europe in the, in the mid-1980s, and many of them are continuing. And they've learned a great deal about the impacts of HIV on children and about HIV-infected children. They're maturing cohorts. Fewer children are being born with HIV in those regions. And they're shifting from concern with morbidity and mortality to really how to optimize the health of these um, maturing young people into adulthood. We know far less about HIV-exposed uninfected children than we do about infected children. And a couple of publications from the United States in the recent years have emphasized how important it is that we get to know more about this. That many of the conditions that predate HIV, mobility, family instability, substance use, socioeconomic disadvantage, pertain after the parents are on treatment. So that HIV exposed uninfected children are very fortunate to have their parents survive to care for them, but are still caring for them under conditions that are not um, helpful for young children or children. But we have very few cohorts 
in high prevalence countries. One of the few uh, exceptions is the HIVNET 012 study in Uganda, which has gone up to five years now. But we have none that have continued for 10 years or more, and all of them focus quite narrowly on attrition, which is an operational issue, and then on uh, survival and growth. But let's just remind ourselves of beacons along the way. It was not so long ago, really, that Elizabeth Preble and Susan Hunter in the same year, 1990, in Social Science and Medicine, published papers in which they called attention to the impending social dis disaster that was uh, coming to countries affected by HIV in southern and eastern Africa. Um, and then it was, we went into a fairly long decade lull where some papers were being published, communities and families were responding to children. And it wasn't really until Jeff Foster and uh, John Williamson published their pathways, it was a review of literature, giving an illustrative pathway of the way in which children were affected by AIDS, that we began to have a kind of, if you like, conceptual framework around which research got organised. And of course, it, it, it wasn't until 2004 that two really quite momentous things happened. The first was the publication of Children on the Brink, which gave the orphan numbers and which mobilised an international response. And secondly, something that still stands for me as a landmark document, the 2004 UNICEF-led fr framework, which I still think needs to be a kind of guiding framework for how we approach this. And then in 2006, uh, Laurent Scher and jo uh, Jeff Foster and I wrote Where the Heart Is, really calling attention to the family strengthening as being at the heart of a massive HIV response of the scale that was needed. And then, of course, 2006 to 2008, we had the Joint Learning Initiative um, uh, on children affected by AIDS. And we're in the building of somebody who was part of that, um, uh, Jim Kim. But remember, it was led by Anis Benigua, now the Minister of Health in Rwanda, Peter Bell, who we remember very fondly, who was a great leader of the Jalaka, um, and many other people. And the Jalaka findings were published and presented in 2008 in Mexico, and then Jalaka was disbanded. But the two strong suggestions from Jalaka, which was again a summary of the evidence to date, was put families at the centre of the response to children. Don't try and reach out and deliver services directly to children by passing families. And the other was the missing key being economic strengthening. The, the, the children who were really taking the greatest knocks were children in the poorest households who had no resources to deal with HIV. Sorry, this, my bottle has got an uneven bottom and it's going to fall, I think. But we, we also needed, during Jalaika, we took stock of what research was available. And I wanted to remind you of Lorraine Scher's um, 2006 review of 383 papers that had been published to date at that time. And you can see that and there was enormous confusion about actually who we were really studying. Um, a largest part, well over 70% of these papers didn't define who children were the subject of the research were. They were vulnerable children. They were. Um, disadvantaged children, there were one single orphans, there were double orphans. So although a lot of people were, were getting into trying to study this field, it was a, the, probably we weren't getting as much out of the field as we could have. But that paper was a wake-up call about strengthening the quality of research. Since then, there's been a massive increase in the no amount of research published. There was the, there's been the coalition, three special issues, and papers on this topic published in some of the best journals in the world, and really a massive increase in just the amount of evidence available. Another leap forward I'd like to believe is this project, and this project has been a special dream of mine, although Chris Desmond has really led it, and it was very much inspired some, by some work I did for WHO in 2004 on uh, the importance of caregiver-child interactions for the survival, growth, and development of children. And in researching that paper, I, do, dro, uh, I dived into the uh, archives at WHO and found records of the series of meetings surrounding John Bowlby, who you all know for his work on attachment. Um, and in 1948, WHO commissioned John Bowlby to review how the world might respond to the acute needs of millions of children left homeless and displaced by World War II. 
And from 1953 to 1955, the WHO hosted four meetings of experts. Now, the names, when you read them, John Bowlby, Eric Erickson, Harry Harlow, Barbara Inhilder, for those of you who have background in social science, these were the great minds of the century at the time. But WHO considered the problem so important that it saw fit to draw these people in and to tap their expertise and to say, what should be our primary response? And the primary response was then articulated in the series of monographs that John Bowlby wrote on attachment and maternal care, which was revised by Mary Ainsworth. But it led to a fundamental shift in policies surrounding the care of children. Institutions across Western Europe were closed down. Children were not separated from parents in nurseries when they were born. A lot of um, effort was put in to keep children in the tender ages between birth and, and two years of age with their parents in order to preserve attachments. And I see this project was very much inspired by the same idea, that there was this massive expertise in the world that we could draw on and that we hadn't done so far. And we, we hadn't done so far partly because we hadn't considered this an important enough problem. And it was important enough to bring the best minds together to say, help us think about how we might respond to this, this problem. And the, the project was articulated in three phases, as, uh, as um, Julia had pointed out. The first phase was a review of evidence taking stock again after Jalaika on this massive amount of research that has subsequently been published. The second phase was to ask the world experts to link the, the results from phase one to what is known about broader long-term impacts on children derived from the uh, literature on child development. And the phase three was um, Chris's work to build a model to estimate the number of children at risk and, and, and at a population level, the longer term consequences for children. So the first paper was led by Scott Kellerman, who's here. The second paper with, by, on psychological impacts was led by Lorraine Scher with Lucy Kluver and others who are both here. And the last one on social impacts was led by Chris um, Desmond. And these papers were all published in the special issue of AIDS. Now, in the review on health impacts, the group really looked at three main topics. They looked at increased mortality and morbidity in utero and in infancy. Now we're talking about exposed children, not infected children, children who are born to an HIV positive mother, but who are not themselves infected. They looked at exposure to other infections, both horizontal infections, opportunistic infections, and they looked at growth, stunting, and developmental delay. And if I look at the mortality and morbidity, um, there is higher in utero, there is higher mortality and morbidity amongst HIV exposed children than non exposed. It's not fully explained. It's believed to be multifactorial and related to immune impairment, which has consequences for later life. Exposure to antiretrovirals amongst these exposed children but uninfected children is also associated in a number of studies now published with increased birth defects, premature deliveries, low birth weight, and a, a range of neuropathies and so on. In infancy, there's higher mortality and exposure and morbidity amongst these exposed children. It's believed to be related to the extent of the mother's illness and her death. And they have more episodes of illness and more severe illness episodes believed to be a result of this immune, potential immune uh, impairment. <laughs> they are exposed to opportunistic infections in the household, TB, and also um, horizontal infections such as um, injections, transfusions, um, wet nursing, masticating food, and so on. These are both, obviously, these categories have to be addressed, but they're not, they're not involved in major numbers of infections of children. And then they looked at stunting and developmental delay. Now, HIV-exposed children have poorer growth, but they're thought to catch up. Um, they have poorer growth also because they have lower birth weight. Now, most delays of HIV-exposed children are attributed to environmental rather than uh, biological conditions, which really puts the onus on us to do something about them. These are not predetermined. They're environmentally determined. They sh children should not be growing up with these difficulties. But recently, the HIVNET 012 study in Uganda, which has followed up exposed children over time, has indicated that these children may not catch up their growth 
and in fact they may reach a th they may achieve a threshold something that I will um, talk about later so if you look at this gro growth HIV infected children grow much more poorly than HIV exposed children this is just height for weight and weight height for age and weight for age they also measured the head circumference and so on but a very important thing is that both groups are below the they're both falling below the norm so they're not growing normally, even though HIV exposed children are growing slightly better. And this is on five year follow. And this study also has developmental measures which will shortly be published. So the evidence on these health effects is that there's fairly good evidence of health impacts on HIV affected children, not infected, especially with respect to birth outcomes, growth and development in infancy. And long-term follow-up of these children is needed in high prevalence settings. We need to be enrolling children in cohorts, in pregnancy, as they've done in Europe, in the United States, in Britain. And we need to follow up HIV-exposed children, particularly now related to the questions about toxicities of, of uh, ARTs, follow them up into childhood and early adolescence and into the risk period of early adulthood. And there are very few intervention studies that looks specifically at this group of children with respect to these outcomes. Now, if we look at the second paper in this first phase, the psychological impacts of adult HIV, Lorraine, Lucy, and their colleagues reviewed a very comprehensively um, a wide range of topics, under th which I've classified under three categories. The first is with respect to the effects of HIV on parenting or caregiving. The second is experiences that are common to HIV-affected children, bereavement, poverty, stigma, abuse, bullying, so on, and impacts on children's functioning. That is the outcome in, uh, impacts, cognitive, behavioral functioning, and so on. Now, the effects on parenting, obviously, dis parental death is the most studied of these phenomena. Parental mental health, depression, is also has been frequently studied, but illness, impoverishment, stigmatization, and so on also affect parenting and are covered in the review. And in a, a review published by Lorraine in 2011, she looked at HIV and depression, and depression is associated with HIV and may share risk factors, and it affects the course of HIV, which independently of depression may affect children, because depression affects HIV through reduced adherence. So pre- and postnatal depression are very high amongst HIV, um, a woman living with HIV, as high as 30 to 40 percent found in a across a range of countries. And if we look at the child development literature, um, which Alan Stein did, um, parental depression is well established um, as a long term, having long term effects on children. With respect to childhood experiences, uh, the group looked at traumatic disclosure. I just want to give you a sense of the number of papers they were able to review, bereavement, institutionalization, stigmatization, including bullying and abuse. abuse. Now, strangely enough, some of these areas are really have quite substantial research behind them, and others have less. And it's one of the great things of this project is having partnered with CDC and Jim Mercy and the group there around bringing the enormous knowledge about abuse from there into the um, HIV-affected children literature, because actually, although abuse is widely reported, much of it is qualitative and less of it is actually published, peer-reviewed. Um, they also covered, this group also covered impoverishment, and there's considerable evidence, as is brought out by the Social Impacts paper, on the effects of um, increased financial strain. And that poverty increases the odds of all the other risks, partly because they share commonalities with those risks, but all poverty also involves less access to support and services. There's not much in, uh, evidence around social support, but it, what there is is intuitive. Social support enables children to cope better. Impacts on children's functioning. I'm not going to deal with the evidence around HIV-positive children. 75 studies, most of them in the same direction, showing that HIV-positive children suffer some form of deficits in the cognitive domain. But Lorraine's group reviewed uh, 12 studies on HIV-affected children, seven of which show these kinds of deficits. On the emotional and mental health impacts, most um, studies focus on orphan children, and most tend to focus on short-term 
impacts, but one study found worsening mental health four years after parental death, or that it could potentially be affected by other intervening influences, such as the quality of care that an orphan receives after parental death. So on, in terms of social and behavioural functioning, acting out and delinquency, while at early point was a concern that you, there'd be these hordes of, of, of not well-behaved orphans around, there's actually just no evidence around uh, this being a, 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 an outcome. Risk behaviour, there's several studies now showing that um, HIV, uh, being HIV affected is associated with um, risk behaviours in ad adolescence. And resilience, while identified in the HIV literature is important, is also identified in the child development literature. Actually, two systematic reviews have both identified that there's very little evidence on this issue. So a lot of research in this area. Most results show the same trends, negative effects for HIV-affected children. Um, Lorraine's work has showed the studies still need to be more rigorous than they are. There remain definitional issues, there remain measurement issues and controlling for confounders. What we realised in this project was how much more research on stigma was needed, that it was an under, identified as an underlying um, uh, or covariant factor in most of the research, but actually very little research on it. And we still suffer from paucity of intervention research, although I think we have started to feel that this is changing, that more, there is more rigorous research on um, interventions. I mean, this is just the King Review in 2009, that there were no, no um, interventional evaluations of community-based provision to support bereaved children. The last paper focused on the social impacts of adult HIV and um, we looked at four outcomes, which are not necessarily independent of each other, access to healthcare, access to school, nutrition and child labour, looked at four potential pathways, economic strain, stigma, parental illness and death, and deterioration in the care of children. And um, this is the model that um, I'll come back to, um, really illustrating the, um, the stage of HIV illness, that these potentially are the the mediating factors, and here are the outcomes, and a lot would depend on this context. And I'll come back to this model later. So economic strain um, is caused by uh, income being terminated, either by illness, by diversion to care, it, higher expenditure on HIV-related care, funeral costs, and costs related to mobility and um, increased care burden. So people moving around and taking in others in order to share the burden of care. Now, there's strong evidence of this as, as an impact of HIV. Its effect on children, though, depends very much on the baseline level of the families prior to HIV, how, much, how many assets they have, what savings, what social capital they can draw on, but can lead directly to destitution and lack of protection for children. Changing or deteriorating childcare, while the care of children clearly changes when parents become ill, Surprisingly, little is known about this. It's believed to lead to reduced supervision and care, but mostly qualitative evidence. Parental death, very good evidence that it will lead to increased mortality amongst young children and infants and increased likelihood of moving households. So children will go to other forms of care once a mother, particularly a mother, dies. There's some evidence of discrimination in new households and increased likelihood of institutionalization. This is largely anecdotal, but clearly a very important area for future study. Impacts on schooling, um, again, while some studies report this, a lot of this evidence comes from DHS studies and is highly country dependent, different circumstances in different countries. Um, both socioeconomic status and stigma <coughs> might be part of the, pe the pathway, as is parental illness and death and changes in childcare. There are definitely impacts on healthcare. Um, it's found it, with respect to PMTCT follow-up, some evidence of stigma on reduced use of health services by families, um, so much so that HIV-exposed children less access to vaccination, um, fewer healthcare visits, parental illness and death, and changes in childcare. And impacts on nutrition, we know that economic strain leads to reductions in consumption, that parental illness, um, we've talked about the growth delays and um, that they may catch up, although there's now some doubt cast on that. And there are some reports of discrimination against children taken into relatives' households in terms of food. <coughs> 
impacts on child labour, much less evidence than we um, thought there was. Clearly, when a, a household is under economic strain, there's need for child labour, um, including transactional sex, might be associated with school dropout. The strongest evidence actually comes from follow-ups of parents going on to treatment, which shows increases in school enrolment and decreases in child labour. So what about what's the overall sense of the evidence? Good evidence of these social impacts on HIV-affected children. Um, pathways much less clear. Without intervention, HIV-affected children are at risk of less access to health care and schooling, poorer nutrition, more likely to engage in child labour. And financial strain is a strong underlying mechanism in all of this. So having um, taken that, tried to grasp the, the research, largely picking up from 2008 but going beyond that, we turn to the second part, which was learning from the broad field of child development. And we have to remember that pediatrics, child psychiatry, developmental psychology are very old disciplines that began in the mid-1800s. And I just pulled up this one article just to illustrate to you. In 1898, in the Journal of Developmental Psychology, called Genetic Psychology, the paper on the only child in the family. So, you know, these things have been studied for a very long time in the core disciplines. So we invited eight, eight world experts to review the phase one findings and to suggest from the knowledge of the broader field what experiences are likely to have long-term effects on children. These are the people we asked with respect to parental mental health, Alan Stein from Oxford, parental illness and death, we asked Oscar Barbarin from Tulane, who's with us, nutrition, Ari Stein from Emory, who's with us today, on child development, Maureen Black, on attachment, Martinez van Eisendorn, who's not here, but we're very lucky to have Chuck Nelson from Harvard to speak about attachment and his work. On violence, Jim Mercy and the team at CDC, who's with us today. Stigma, Seth Kalishman, and Re resilience, James Garbarino. Many of you who will remember James um, and his work as, as um, the person who really took up the, the Yuri Bronfenbrenner ecological model uh, in developmental psychology. And behind this, is poverty as a background condition. And that paper is also published in the special issue of AIDS. Now, beginning at the beginning, all children will experience distress or delay when poorly fed, ill, separated from loved ones and friends, insecure, anxious about parental health, bereaved, subject to cruelty, and excluded. So all children and we would be concerned about children who weren't experiencing distress at these events. However, what was very much brought out by the expertise of this group was the dependence of these effects over a longer term, whether they will endure and become debilitating, depends very much on the context of occurrence, taking an ecological perspective. And this context would be made up of the child's psychology and biology, the family, the neighbourhood, the community and school, available services, and simultaneously, and very important in relating to the, the notion of resilience, opportunities for recovery. So most children will recover over time since the exposure with support from family and community. So under, the, under normal conditions, what um, um, is sometimes we call average expectable conditions for children. Most children will recover without additional support. In fact, James Garbarino said 60 to 80 percent of children show no enduring ill effects, except where the exposure has certain characteristics, where it affects an already vulnerable child, for example, a premature child or a blind child where it alters basic biological and psychological processes. For example, when it occurs within the sensitive window of massive brain development during fetal life and early child development in infancy, what is sometimes called the first thousand days. When it is multiple and where there's little, if any, opportunity for recovery. So let's look at those in a bit more detail. The disruption of early biopsychological processes. Now, several of my colleagues are going to speak to those, and three of them seem to be very potently related to long-term outcomes. They are stunting, institutionalization, and exposure to violence. Effect 
if they occur in early life, affect fundamental biological and psychological processes, and thereby are likely to have enduring impacts on children. Now, this is just an illustration, it's not data, just an illustration from the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, in which CDC is very uh, intimately involved with Casa Permanente, which was a retrospective study looking at adults in and, and asking them to retrospectively record adverse experiences from their childhood. But what a very large number of papers from this study has shown, that an increase in the number of poor outcomes with increasing numbers of adverse experiences that are experienced in childhood. So the more bad things that happen to children, we can predict with a fair degree of certainty are likely to lead to worse outcomes. And, that, and this finding has been replicated in other parts of developmental psychology by people like Michael Rutter, for example. Now, what we know is that conditions of poverty increase the likelihood. If you look at the number of, of one risk exposure, in fact, middle-income children are much more likely to have one. Some kind of risk exposure is good for children to be challenged meet new people, to go to a new school, that sort of thing, are all good risks for children, good exposure. But as you look at the accumulation of risks to three, four, five, six risks, children living in poverty are manyfold more likely to experience these accumulated risks than children not. Um, and in addition to the greater exposure, there's fewer services. P poor people have less access to them, the fewer services and the exposures are more likely to endure, meaning conditions are not likely to suddenly improve. And this is a wonderful sketch from um, Susan Walker's paper in The Lancet on in Child Development, which shows the track of optimal child development and the track of adverse child development exposed to multiple risks, and then shows how interventions at this early age can push children whose development is on the wrong track, is way below potential, can ra raise it up to close to, and in Susan Walker, in, in the Jamaican study, actually with both nutrition and stimulation input in this early input, brought it to par with unaffected children. So very powerful, the potential of early interventions to rectify the trajectory of children's development if they've started off poorly. And it really is the call to say we have to, there's a kind of moral obligation to do something about this, because it does work, it can be done, it is feasible. So the, one of the other things that the, um, the Child Development Group brought out was the importance of protect, protective factors. That we were looking at situations in which children were exposed to adversity, but some of those children were very fortunate to have a number of protective factors. Child temperament is a very strong protective factor, high sociability. We were also, our attention was also drawn to the work of Rona and his colleagues who have looked at cultures across the world and shown that a, a single dimension of parental love and acceptance, warmth versus what they called rejection, was a strong underlying factor to better and worse outcomes for children. School, neighborhood and peers, and the available services, culture, beliefs. And this, I think we were really drawn to attention that's now taking place, in, of research now taking place in the United States, looking at not only counting risk factors, but looking at children who can accumulate assets, protective assets. And um, of course, these are the things that we would look to for guidance in terms of intervention. So, commenting on the child development research and its relevance to us, there's good longitudinal data, and I've been skimpy on talking about some of these things because I know that Ari and Chuck and Jim are going to be talking in much more detail. But there's good longitudinal and some prospective data. Remember, we have studies that go on for the full lifespan in both low and, and middle and high income countries. So we really, it's not hypothetical, it's been tested, children have been looked at prospectively across this. They've been looked at in a variety of contexts, so the strengths of the effects are well tested. And the strongest evidence relates to the following factors, early childhood. It, uh, we hope we'll have a lot of time tomorrow to talk about it, and I know that Ari and, and Chuck's papers today will emphasize this too. 
nutrition, attachment, parental, uh, uh, mental health in early childhood are fundamental. Childhood and the issue of abuse. Now, we do have one 30-year prospective study in the United States which has found that abuse in childhood is related to a range of sexual high-risk behaviours, including um, HIV infection. And I'm talking about the Wilson and Widom's uh, paper. Multiple risks. As soon as these risks accumulate for children, children are in very difficult and very dangerous situations. And then importantly, lack of opportunities to recover. And this was the point brought out very strongly in the work of Michael Rutter, the British the child psychiatrist. It is the relentlessness of adversity that traps children. If only they had an opportunity for recovery. And then overriding almost everything is the protection of supportive intimate caregivers who can protect children from many of these risks. And thereby the you know, increasing evidence for focusing on family strengthening, caregiver strengthening. So from this, um, Chris developed a conceptual model, which I think also very much underlies the model, which looks at two critical factors in thinking about the long-term impacts on children of HIV. The first is the stage of adult HIV, and the second has to do with the resources the family has to deal with HIV. So if you look at this, and it's, Chris will deal very much with this stage of adult HIV. We cannot just talk about children exposed to HIV. There are children exposed in situations where their parents are un, un, um, not non-symptomatic, do not know they're HIV positive, where they know they are, but they're asymptomatic, where they become ill, when they get onto treatment, when they are not adherent and they become ill again. All of these, and when they die, are different exposures for children. And we have to think about clearly that these are different, and children will have different experiences in them. And they will change the environment of children in different ways. And then the resources that families have to, to deal with them, of course, does depend on some child-specific factors, but also on family resources, social support, the availability of services, and so on. And they will have these effects through the, the things we were talking about, reduced consumption, discrimination, reduced service access, abuse, and so on, and they will affect these this, several domains of children's functioning. But the things that the child development literature made us think about that we haven't been thinking about with respect to HIV was what difference do the differences make? Now, a lot of the HIV research is comparisons of groups, one with the other, and reporting statistical differences. Now, if you think back to that Uganda graph I showed you on children's growth, indeed, there were um, statistically significant differences between HIV-infected children's growth and HIV-exposed children's growth. One of the things that make those differences also very important is that they're below the threshold. So we have to start asking some of the differences that we are reporting between children, between groups of children, or children at different stages. Are these statistical differences, or do they reach threshold effects such that they become meaningful in the child's life, and we need to revisit this. The second is, to what extent are effects diffused or concentrated amongst HIV-affected children? And from the available literature, we can't say this, actually. Are all children suffering a few or a little bit of these adversities? Or are a few children carrying a whack of these things? They're concentrated in a subpopulation. The clustering of these adversities, to what extent do these risks or impacts cluster in a subpopulation of children? And lastly, to what extent do these exposures compound or amplify one another? So being stunted in early childhood, what does that do in terms of compounding school impacts and so on? Or what does it mean to drop out of school in terms of changing life trajectory and therefore amplifying or compounding or accumulating later effects. And these things are critically important for intervention, because if we knew that, that effects were diffused, or if we know that they are concentrated, we would approach them in different ways. So I know that tomorrow we're going to spend the whole morning on uh, looking at 
program implications, but I thought for people who are not going to go, uh, not going to be there tomorrow, and I know Chris is also going to make some statements about program implementations, I'd like to leave you with these thoughts. I hope I have um, brought home to you the fact that there isn't a population of affected children who, if we massed an army of people, we could reach tomorrow, because children will become affected all the time. That there's a swathe of children and that we can't any longer think of only the children existing now who are affected. We have to think of the children whose parents will become infected tomorrow and next week and the year after. And how does that affect the way we think about what we can and should be doing? We need to provide support to families at the earliest stage of adult HIV. I work with colleagues who do a lot of research on HIV testing and have moved from community-based testing to home-based testing. And I know they all use the CDC risk reduction model of, of counselling. And, and I always say to them, you know what, if I was told I was HIV infected, the first thing I think about is what about my children? And it's not part of testing, and yet it is in the top of people's minds. And it's a moment, and one of the things that home-based testing does is give this opportunity for the family to take cognizance as a family of what this event is and allow children to be part of the testing and the movement into treatment and care and support. We need to, the evidence is now almost incontestable that we have to intervene in early childhood. If children leave the first few years of life with accumulative deficits, it is going to be extremely difficult. It's not impossible, theoretically it's not impossible, but it is extremely difficult practically to reverse those in any way, and the opportunity exists to substantially alter the trajectory of children by intervening in the earliest years. And we have with a massive expansion of PMTCT, this is given to us on a plate we actually should be in the PMTC pro PMTCT programs, enrolling and supporting families from the very beginning. And we need to think differently about the programs that we're running to prevent and remedy stunting institutionalization and abuse. These will need intensive programs. Children who experience these, if, uh, ex these things are not going to respond to what is often a quite light touch intervention model that is currently um, put into practice. That the kind of, um, so besides the ongoing effects, um, I, have, I keep emphasizing this idea that more children are affected and that what we need is a kind of series of approaches. We need to have supportive public health and social policies you know, this has been an insight in the HIV AIDS um, uh, um, response from the very beginning. Jonathan Mann probably articulated that more than anybody else. If this environment doesn't become easier for people to live in, then we will not get on top of HIV. So things that prevent discrimination, enable access to services, that give economic assistance to destitute families will help all children and will particularly help HIV-affected children. We need to move to population-based and not project approaches. We are not going to reach the numbers of children we need to reach if we don't, um, great activist ally I've just seen spotted in the audience, if we don't, even if in our implementation we can only manage a particular geographical area, this needs to be done in planful ways so that we have population-based approaches. And I think, and Chris will speak to this too, that children have to become an integral part of the adult response. Family-based, home-based services make sense for supporting the earliest testing of ch children, getting them onto treatment, getting support to their parents as early as possible, supporting their parents' adherence so they don't become ill, and providing assistance to the family as a whole. Um, if we're talking about greater efficiencies, because HIV money is getting tighter, and I'm from South Africa, we can already palpably feel the constriction of HIV money. We have to look for efficiencies and more effective ways, and it seems to me integrating services at the level of the family and the household will benefit both the prevention, the treatment, and the care and support response, and particularly the care of children. And I just wanted to say something lastly about the um, kind of in intensive multi-level programs we're going to need for stunting abuse 
and institutionalization that go from a broad level. Some people are doing these kind of programs, many more are doing these kind of programs, but we have to fill in this, pro this triangle. We've got to have laws, policies, provisions, mass media that will support programs to reduce all of these. Um, it's distressing to be in southern and eastern Africa and to see that orphanages are still proliferating at the rate at which they are. In countries where war orphans are so brutally treated because funds have dried up, there has to be a much more coordinated response to deal with institutionalization. Stunting, uh, Ari will speak to this, but even in a middle-income country like South Africa, 28% of zero to three-year-olds are stunted. And as James will, Jim Mercy will talk about from the CDC, we are only just beginning to appreciate the magnitude of the problems of violence against children of multiple kinds. And then we need this kind of program that many of you involved in, the family, the community, school, health service, awareness raising and skill building programs. But there are going to be a group of children and families that are going to need much more uh, intensive services than those. And we need to be mindful about how to put those services into place to be appropriate to the group of people who need them. So I'm just going to close by saying that part three is going to be what Chris is going to present later and is also published in that um, special issue. So thank you very much. Do you want me to stay for some comments and questions? It's on. Hi. Hey, Linda. Apple. Great to see you. Um, my name is Paul Zeitz. I'm in the Office of Strategy at the Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator. Um, thanks for that brilliant presentation. I have a couple questions. Can I get a copy of the slides, number one? Number two, can I get a copy of the AIDS issue, because I would really like to have one to read. Um, number three, um, it's, your analysis and your synthesis is really quite brilliant. I have a couple questions. One. Where, why don't you mention explicitly and in include in our thinking about how to respond to all this, PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. It's a DSM-5 defined uh, psychiatric disorder. Children that are living in poverty, that are sexually assaulted, and that are orphaned suffer from PTSD. And I've been at these meetings for like the last 20 years, and I, I always ask the question, why doesn't anyone mention or talk about PTSD? I have a Zambian son who I adopted. He was 12, 11 when he lost his mom. Uh, he was 12 when he came into our family. He suffers from PTSD. And like you have to define it and then resolve it and respond to it. So that's like a big, I, I've never understood why our community doesn't like label it and deal with it. It fits into your triangle. It does. Hmm. So, but it's not mentioned. You didn't, I didn't hear you mention. Right. I came in late, so I apologize. But I was like, why, do, why don't we even say the word PTSD? So the second question is, is like the uh, resilience and assets, uh, children, developmental assets that you defined. Are, it's brilliant. Can we come up with one indicator to measure that's a proxy indicator for measuring resilience? My idea that I've been uh, throwing around is the developmental milestones. If we can include that as a metric, then we can measure, it's a proxy. It, it, it's uh, the triangle that you have is so complex, it's multi-sectoral, multi-layer, whatever. But if we're actually measuring children's uh, uh, meeting of developmental milestones, then that's a proxy for the developmental assets and the children's resilience because the fat mom has to, everyone has to be helping that kid reach those milestones. And then we can have a, measure, a metric that we can run around saying, we're helping kids reach their development milestones. Then we can flood uh, high HIV areas with this triangle of interventions. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, the PTSD, I, th I see very much as the top part of the corner of abuse, but could also be institutionalization and other things. So it's a kind of clinical, the sense of the cl clinical implications of it. With respect to the single indicator, as many meetings you've been for 20 years, I've been at indicator meetings for 20 years, and there isn't a single indicator for children's development. Um, because. Uh, enabling a three-month-old baby to reach for an object is one indicator. Um, 
a six-year-old knowing uh, the meaning of the word cold or hot or uh, what you should do about it when you are cold or hot, that's a developmental indicator. And we just, I think it's a wrong question, but for the under threes, my bet would be if you're living with a healthy mother, you is a very good indicator of your likely well-being. But I think it would keep people busy forever to kind of decide that. I mean, certainly in the early child development literature, we're trying to puzzle over that one, and there's a lot of debate about it. Um, Ari is here, and um, he and I work in a research group in which we think that linear growth, height or length, is a very good pro uh, proxy in the early years for health and well-being. Children do not grow when they are not in loving, supportive relationships with their mothers. So I think there's a lot of ideas about it, but no consensus whatsoever. Oh, the copies are outside, Paul, of the journal. Uh, it's also the Coalition for Children Affected by AIDS paid for open access, so it's freely downloadable off the journal website, and I'm sure the PowerPoints will be available. But thank you very much.